Uh, can we get the lights? <laughs> So um, I've been researching Pueblo history for about 40 years, and I'm really fascinated by the history of Pueblo. It's my hometown. I was born here, and uh, I'm an archivist here at the museum, and I'm so grateful to be able to uh, help preserve the history of a really interesting Old West town, which Pueblo was. And if you look back, I tell people all the time, if you uh, think about Fort Hill in the 1800s, think of the movie Tombstone, and that's a true Wild West movie. You, there was gunfights, there were saloons on almost every corner, brothels, yeah. cowboys, Indians, stagecoaches, all the cool stuff you can think of in the Wild West town of Portland had it. And none of it would be possible without this man, uh, Royal Porter Putnam, who was born in 1837 in Pennsylvania, Covington, Pennsylvania. And uh, we don't know a lot about his uh, youth or childhood, uh, the name of the talk is uh, The Lost Years, and so basically I want to start the talk with uh, history that we know of. Most of the history we know for him is from 1858 to 1860, and then from 1863 to his death in 1889. Uh, but there's three years that are kind of a mystery, we just don't know a whole lot about. So um, Dan Hogan, uh, who's a Portal historian, uh, has a theory, and I think he'll do a good job of putting that forward. So uh, I'll just start. What I did uh, in 2016, I created a historical timeline of Portland's history. And so there's uh, some facts in here uh, that basically it gives rudimentary, rudimentary facts. And so I'm going to cover some of these. I'll read from this, and I'll expound and speak on some of this stuff also. So. Uh, 1837, August 5th, uh, the future founder of Porterville, Royal Porter Putnam, is born in Covington, Pennsylvania, to Thomas Putnam and Zilpha Miller Porter. Thomas Putnam's ancestors came from England to the American colony of Massachusetts in, eight, in the 1600s. So his ancestry goes all the way back to the very beginnings of, a, of American colonization. So he has that in his roots. Um, hear me or know much about him until 1858. He kept a diary, which was published in 1961, and it's wonderful. It gives a real picture of his life. And basically, he was leaving Pennsylvania to uh, with his uh, uncle Royal uh, to New Orleans, where he had a home. And then from New Orleans, uh, he traveled to Texas. His uncle had property in Texas also. So he spent uh, summer months there in Texas. And then he decides he wants to go to California, where almost everybody's going anyways, and uh, ends up uh, taking the, or ends up in Yuma, uh, Arizona, gets ill and almost dies, and then uh, is able to convalesce and recuperate. And then he takes the, the Buttercup Overland mail stagecoach from uh, Yuma through Los Angeles on what they call the Los Angeles Stockton Road comes through Tule River, which is what this place used to be called in the early days before it was ever Portersville. It was Tule River, it was a settlement, but basically a frontier settlement. Uh, crossed through here, ended up in Visalia. Uh, this tin type was likely taken in Visalia in December or January, December 58, January 59 in Visalia. So that's what he looks like at age 21. And uh, you know, he basically was penniless he came here broke, and uh, he ends up working for uh, for the uh, Butterfield Overland Mail. And I'm just going to go back to my timeline and start reading some of this. Uh, 1858, starting in October, Butterfield Overland Mail Stage Line has a station at Tule River. Looks like glasses. Has a station at Tule River. Peter Goodhue is the first station manager. He is a liveryman li living in Visalia at this time and likely employed someone at that station. A young 21-year-old R. Porter Putnam travels through there on the stage that year, I mean, through Truly River. In December, on his way to Visalia uh, from Los Angeles, Charles and Isaac Putnam, no relation to Porter Putnam, are in charge of the Butterfields Packwood Station. Um, 
10 miles east of Visalia, today's Farmersville, Porter gets hired by the company on December 10th and works there uh, with these Putnams as the hostler for $30 a month. Porter writes in his diary, there, there are plenty of acorn gals or maids of the forest close by, many uh, native ladies. Uh, on April 1st, Porter's employment ends with the Overland Mail Company. He continues to stay on with uh, Charles Putnam at Packwood Station. Isaac has moved on to the Comstock Blue Silver Strike in Nevada. Uh, a very early tent type of Porter Putnam exists from this era. Um, so this tent type actually turned up. Uh, there was another early settler that got here before Porter Putnam in Success Valley um, by the name of Wilcox. This ended up in, Porter, in, in Wilcox Adobe. It was uh, nailed to the wall and that was saved and luckily it's, it's here today at the museum on display uh, in our exhibit, which I suggest everybody takes a look at after this when they get refreshments, go check out the Porter Putnam exhibit in here at the museum. Um, Porter Putnam establishes a ranch at Outside Creek east of Visalia between Exeter and Visalia. Uh, this is in 1859. Uh, in May of 1860, uh, Putnam is living at Tule River in Peter Goodhue's old place on the north side of the river on the high ground. The shake cabin has chimneys on either end. He brings his hogs and begins a trading venture with, with the local Indians, stockmen, and immigrants. Telegraph wire reaches Tule River in June. Porter loses his ranch at Outside Creek when he discovers that the man he has left in charge has sold his property and ran off with the proceeds. So he got ripped off early on, and he had very little, so you can imagine. Uh, John C. Fremont visits with Porter at Tule River. That's important because um, we know that he and Fremont did business, and of course Fremont was famous as a uh, trailblazer out here in California. Uh, he basically writes in his diary that the mosquitoes and hot weather are unbearable at times, and Porter vows to leave leave the area. He and the men of the region pass their time with whiskey, gin, and playing cards. He often visits Charles and his wife Delphine Putnam across the river and Origin Wilcox uh, to the east. The only single women are natives and immigrants passing through. Porter's journal ends about this time and is believed that he only stays in the area for about three months. This is right about 1860. Um, July 3rd, uh, Royal Putnam, Charles Putnam and wife Dell are noted in the Keysville U.S. Census on the Kern River. Uh, Royal Putnam is listed as a merchant and Charles is a hotel keeper. Neither is counted in the Tulu River Census, so that's important. So we know he's not back here uh, at that time. He's over in Keysville heading northeast. Um, so one of the theories that's been put forth and has been written about is that he might have worked for uh, this Dr. I.C. Kelly in Visalia, who was a uh, he was a dentist, and we have dentist tools that belong to uh, Porter Putnam. His uncle was had dentistry trained, and so there's a theory that that might be it. But in later biographies written about him in his lifetime, there's no mention of that. So it's again, it's still a mystery what happened to him between 1860 and 1863. Um, and right about this time, the American Civil War is starting. Uh, Tulare County is decidedly Southern sympathizing. And so uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Hogan uh, with, with his idea of what probably happened in those three years. Okay, so. Um, I'm also uh, from Porterville. I've lived here all my life. I was born here, raised here. And uh, so I got interested in, in history of US, California, Tulare County, and Porterville when I was very early in my teenage years. And one of the things that I did when I was a teenager, I read this diary. And it didn't really sink in, it was okay. And then I read it again when I was in my 20s. And that's when I realized that what's written in here, what was written about Porterville and Porter Putnam in later books, didn't jive. They didn't go with each other. There was something odd about a town being.
being named after somebody's middle name. It should be Putnamville, right? But it's not, it's named after a guy's middle name. So I thought that was odd. And so I got into history and I got into Civil War reenacting. And then I met Bill Horst. We were doing reenactings up there at Fort Tejon. And I asked him, I said, how come the diary and what's written about Porter Putnam don't go with each other? And he laughed and he said, I've been telling everybody this for 20 years. Now this was 20 years ago when he said this to me. And he told me a story about Charles and Isaac Putnam. And he said, there were actually more, there was actually four guys by the same last name living in the same area. Charles had two brothers, so there's three Putnam brothers and Porter. Too many Putnams living in one area. So the records, which are vague to begin with, have been confused. And he's the one that first told me, Charles is the guy running the stage station on Tule River, not Porter. And I said, what happened to Charles? And he said, I don't know, I can't find him. I said, I'll find him. This is when the internet first started. And the biggest thing on the internet was genealogy. Everybody was into genealogy back then. So I got on, about, took me about two weeks, and I found what happened to Charles and his brothers. They left here in 66 and ended up in Arizona. And I told him about it. He said, now we can tell the rest of the story of what happened around here. So that was over 20 years ago. And I, I'm mentioning Charles because he's going to be very important as to what Porter was doing in those missing years. And we're talking about a very specific time period. The diary ends in July of 1861. And we don't hear anything about Porter until he buys the section of land for Peter Goodhue in February of 64. There's a two and a half year gap. We have no idea what he's doing or where he is, okay? Now, before I get on to my theory, we got a, I can paint you a picture of what Tulare County was like back then. It was a lot bigger than it is today. Tulare County, Kings County, and most of Kern County were part of Tulare County. Tulare County was all the way to what was then Utah Territory. It was, there was no Nevada, it was Utah Territory, which later became the territory of Nevada. Tulare County was all the way out there. And north and way, the Owens Valley, most of it was Tulare County and the Coso Mountains and the Inyo Mountains, all the way out there to the, to the, to the uh, Death Valley was all Tulare County back then, okay? So that's the picture that we're at. So, so again, we have a two and a half year gap where we don't know what's going on. Okay, so, the end of the diary, he specifically tells us he's penniless, he owns no land, he doesn't know what he's going to do, he's hanging out with Charles and the boys on Tule River, doing a lot of drinking and chasing Indian maidens in the forest, that's what he says, and he's thinking about going to Visalia. That's where the diary ends. So, when he shows up here in February of 64, what does he do? He comes back and his pockets are full of money. How do we know this? The first thing he does is he buys a section of land and pays Peter Goodhue $200. The next thing he does is he builds a sawmill up there where the Indian reservation is today. There's a place up there that they call Porter Putnam site, sawmill site. There's nothing there, just an empty pit place, but he builds a sawmill to saw the wood to build his business right here. You gotta buy the equipment to do that, right? And you gotta have a team and wagons or hire somebody to haul that lumber down here. That costs money too. You also gotta employ people to help you. You're not gonna do it by yourself. So then he builds his building, his establishment. It's, a, it's an inn, trading post, business, upstairs of the living quarters, downstairs is his business. And you can't, you gotta buy windows and all kinds of other things. You can't, you can't make those in a sawmill. You gotta buy all that too. Also, he goes back to New York and gets married to Mary Jane Packard. 
presumably he took a steamship from here all the way around to New York and gets married. Presumably he either pays for or helps pay for that wedding. And then he buys all the furniture in New York and hauls it, has it all shipped back to Stockton, to Visalia, to here. That's a lot of money for a guy that was penniless just two and a half years before this. He buys a section of land, he picks a couple of plots for himself, and then he gives the rest of the land away. Most pioneers sell the lots when they establish a town. He gave them away, what does that tell you? He doesn't need the money, because he's loaded. So where did he get all this money in just two and a half years? Well, we have to find out what's going on in California, Tulare County, 1861, 62, 63. What's going on? Anybody know? Where do you make a lot of money in a short period of time? The California Gold Rush is still going on. The Mariposa mines have slowed down, but the pick and shovel miners, they're spreading out south and east. They're going back over those mountain ranges that they passed on the way over here. And so we have a series of gold strikes and silver strikes starting in 1854-55 on the Kern River. You get the town of Pete Kernville, which back then was Whiskey Flat. Keysville comes up back then. You have the gold strikes on White River, 59-60. You have, starting in 1860, there's three big strikes out in the Owens Valley. And they're, they, they're in um, succession. The first one is a place called Aurora, which doesn't exist anymore. The next one is Bodie, which everybody knows about that. And the next one is Virginia City. Those are the three big strikes that happened right about the same time. Aurora is the very first boom town to develop at that same exact period of time that we're talking about, okay? So that's clue, that's where you get rich back then in a short period of time. John mentioned that the Putnam boys are not enumerated in the 1860 census here. They're over there. They're getting their mail in Keysville. If you don't know where Keysville used to be, it's where Lake, Six, Lake um, Isabella Dam is. Across from the dam, there's a sign that says Keysville. There's nothing there, but that's where the town was, okay? So the route went from Stockton to Visalia, through Julie River, across Greenhorn to Keysville, over Walker Pass, down into the Owens Valley. That was the route. So they're enumerated there. Charles Putnam and his wife, Isaac Putnam and Porter Putnam are getting their mail in Keysville. Now, in the 1860 census, the census takers didn't go to your house and they didn't send you mail. They went to the post offices and opened up the ledgers and the records, and they just took all the information off the post office, what the postmaster had. Just because you get your mail in a certain area doesn't mean that's where you live. That just means that's the nearest post office. And in 1860, Keysville is the nearest post office for anybody living out there in the Owens Valley. The very next post office is Genoa, which is way up there going to Reno Tahoe. So anybody living in the Owens Valley gets their mail in Keysville, okay? So we know that they're up to something over there. In 1861, Charles Putnam establishes a trading post on Independence Creek, which is where the town of Independence is today. He's the founder of that town also. He built a stone trading post because the Paiute Indians were always on the war path, and that was a safe place to go hide out in case there was an Indian attack. This is 61 now. That becomes the trading post and the new post office now for anybody living in the Owens Valley. You get your mail at Independence now instead of Keysville. Also checking BLM records, I see Charles and Isaac Putnam have mining claims in the Inyo Mountains, which is north of Independence. There's also a cattle ranch out there owned by Charles and Isaac Putnam. So what are they doing? They're hauling supplies over there to these boom towns because what are they doing? They're the, they're the, they're the businessmen. They're mining the miners. That's how you get rich. 
You don't get rich out there looking for gold. You get rich selling the stuff to the miners. That's what these guys were doing. And we know Porter is with them because he tells us in his diary. That's who he's hanging out with. So wherever they, they're at, it's safe to assume that that's where Porter's at. Okay, so. So then we figure they're up to something over there. Something's going on over there. And then I find my research kind of slowed down. I couldn't find any information. And then I go to the lo a local thrift store and I find this book. <clears throat> Gunfighters, Highwaymen, and Vigilantes, Violence on the Frontier. I'm thinking, oh, this is another one of these Jesse James, Dalton Gang, Tombstone books, which I'm interested in. And I turn a few pages, and I see this map. And I look at it, and it's Eastern Tulare County back then. And the, the author calls it the Trans Sierra Country, which is basically Eastern California, Eastern Tulare County. Keysville is on here. The Owens Valley is on here. Whiskey Flats is on here. Bodie, Aurora, all these places are on this in this book. So I start looking in the book, and he mentions that in 1861, a group of men from the what they call the Tulare Valley, which we call the San Joaquin Valley today, drove a herd of cattle over Walker Pass and established the town of Aurora, which back then was in California, today it's in Nevada. Because it was a survey done in 61. Because, like I said, the borders of California kept going that way. And so the territory of Nevada protested, and they had some surveyors come out here in 61 and survey that, that line you see on the map from the south end of Lake Tahoe down to the Colorado River. They established that line and the town of Aurora ended up two miles inside Nevada. But that's, that's for later. So the book mentions uh, Sam Bishop, which is the town of Bishop, is named after several other men, and Charles Putnam as being these guys that drove the first herd of cattle from here to Aurora, Nevada in 1861. The exact same time that Porter says that he's hanging out with Charles Putnam and Isaac Putnam. They established the town of Aurora, which like I said back then was Nevada. So I keep reading more into this book and it's basically cut into two pieces. The first part is all about the violence in Aurora. The second one is all about the violence that happened in Bodie. And it's all the usual shootouts and disputes over mining claims and disputes over women because there was hardly any, any women around. And rowdiness, a lot of politics, remember the Civil War is going on, and you have all these northern and southern miners that are there together. There's a lot of rowdiness, lots of fights, lots of things like that. So I'm reading about all these vignettes, about all this violence, and I get to page 82. I'm going to read you what it says. The sheriff and his deputies are chasing this guy by the name of Poole, who's kind of a ruffian in town. This is Aurora. And they corner him at this saloon. And it says, he had made his mark as a gunfighter in the mighty camps of Tuolumne County and later in Virginia City before joining the Daily Gang in Aurora. The early morning hours of Tuesday, the 2nd of February of 1864, found him, that's his pool guy, and Carter, his partner, and several others playing poker in Porter's Saloon on Antelope Street. And I said, there he is right there. I said, that's him. How many Porters use the name Porter in their business? One, right? He didn't use Royal, he used and he didn't use Putnam, he used Porter. And I said, now it makes sense. 
that's where the money, he gets all the money to do everything that he did when he came back here. You're running a saloon in a boom town. In 1863, the, the aurora starts to fade. And that's what he comes back understand. here. Did it say just Porter, that's all? Porter's Saloon, right. You didn't, didn't, you didn't find the no. last name or anything else? No. Now, do we know it's 100% him? No, because Porter's also a last name. So, but we know that he's with Charles Putnam. We know that Charles Putnam is the, one of the founders of Aurora. My theory is Charles Putnam goes to Porter and says, take this money, go open up a saloon, as soon as it starts to wane, sell it, come back to Tule River, we split the money. Now we know that's where he gets all the money to do what he did, right? All the expenditures and giving away land. I mean, that to me, that's what makes sense because he used the name Porter, he didn't use Putnam, and he didn't use Royal because he had other relatives who are named Royal. And there's too many Putnams running around, right? If you were to establish, come back here and establish Putnam's place, and you got Charles Putnam down the river at his place, you tell somebody, I'm gonna meet you at Putnam's place on Tule River, what's it gonna say? Which one? So you had to distinguish, are you going to Charles's place, or are you going to Porter's place? And Porter's place becomes Porter's Bill, right? <coughs> And that's why it's called, why it's named after somebody's middle name and not their last name. So that's my theory. Any questions? This is a little bit off this, but when the story goes that Porter Putnam took a bunch of horses and a rig and pulled the post office across the track so that it would be called Porter's Bill. I've never, I've heard of that, but I've never been able to, to assert, assert that that's true. Like I said, I've, I've been reading about the foundation of Porterville for years, and what that, what the, what's written and what is in his diary don't go together. And that's why I asked Bill about it over years ago, and he said, I told him this 20 years ago that it wasn't right, that what they were saying wasn't right. So now we can say, not with 100% accuracy, that that's what they were doing. They were over there making money in the boom towns of the Owens Valley. The only place I found Porter over the years was during the uh, count, head count in 1860. He was counted not in Tulare County, not in I said, yeah. Charles Putnam and Charles Putnam's wife and right. Porter were counted in Keysville. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's where they were. But that's where they're getting their mail. Mm -hmm. That's the nearest post office to anywhere out there in the Owens Valley. Yes? Okay, so here's my question. I, you said that he, did you have to own a business to get land or did he give you land to build a house too? Did you have to buy your house land, or did he just give it to you? You mean Porter? Yeah. When yeah, he, he subdivided it into lots, and then what you usually do is, if you're the pioneer, you sell those lots to people coming in. He didn't. He gave them away. But for businesses or for, for homes? For whatever. For everything. For what, whatever you wanted to do. For churches. If you came to settle in his town, you were given a lot free oh, to develop yeah. it as you want. So is that to encourage people to yes, come here? Yes, encourage people to come here. But like I said, most of the time, the, the, these guys sell the land for an income. Yeah, he gave it away. But most places aren't hot and full of mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, but this was a, he knew that this was going to be a good place because you had a river, you had nice, rich land. So that was the attraction. Plus, you have, you're on a route, a major route with a lot of traffic coming from Eastern through Visalia to Stockton. It was a very a well-traveled road, so well-traveled that Charles built two trading posts on both ends of the line. He had one here and one in Independence. That's how much traffic there was back then. Did, did Porter Putnam give away all the lots or did he sell? No, he kept a couple for himself. But did he sell 
they gave away all of the extra lot. As far as I know, he gave them away. Yeah, he didn't give all of them away. He definitely, like Baker, he sold in his lot. People that had money, once he was established, once they had two, you know, a half a dozen businesses yeah. in town. I'm talking at the so. beginning. Yeah. At the beginning, yeah. in 64. Okay. Yeah. Where did you find, who did you find in Aurora? Charles Putnam? Yes. Did you find Isaac and Herkimer? No. Herkimer, according to the diary, went back to Canada. Yeah. That's the third brother. His name is Warner Herkimer. He talks about Herkimer is going to Canada. Oh, oh, how I wish I could go with him. That's Charles' That's other brother. Well, shortly after the time we're talking about, they were down in uh, Arizona. Right. By where they, that strike was that uh, Walker did. By 1875, over in Arizona. these Putnam brothers are all in eastern Pinal County in a place called the Silver King Mine. And they're not miners, they're the superintendents. Because they're in the 1880 census of Arizona Territory, and they're listed as superintendents of the mine. Charles, he is running, again, same thing, a stagecoach stop, a trading post, a post office on the Gila River between Phoenix and Florence. And he a toll road. And he got a toll road. Florence, Globe, that area, he's running a toll road. So he's doing, he's the businessman over there again, just like he was here. And so he, they disappeared in 66. They ended up in Sacramento, they ran a wagon and furniture repair shop called the Putnam Brothers. And then by 1875, they're in Arizona. And Charles Putnam dies in 1889, and he's buried in the old Tucson Cemetery, but there's no marker. If you, you went there and looked for him, you can't find him. Yeah, that's where they ended up. They all ended up over in Arizona. Porter, of course, ends up here. He's the only Putnam left. But by then, the name Porter stuck. So it's Portersville, not Putnamville. Do we know anything about the wife? No. You're talking about Charles' wife. Yeah. She disappears. She's enumerated in Keysville with Charles. By the time he goes to Arizona, he's got him a new wife. He married a new gal by the name of Martha Reed from South Carolina. She was a widow with two children. And we got a hold, he and I, years ago, of one of his descendants, one of his daughter's great-granddaughters. And she knew about Charles being here, but she had no idea of the first wife until we told her. She said, that's his, your, your great-grandma, that's his second wife, but she didn't know. And she came to visit Bill and I years ago. What about Porter's wife? I'll, I'll talk about her. Okay. That's his. That's his expertise. Okay. And if there's no any more questions, that, that's my theory. Thank you. Thank you.